Well, thank you for joining me for the next uh, 30 minutes or so as we look at a parable of Jesus that is found in the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 20. Before we do that, though, just want to say thank you for your support. Jumping on our website, myfaithchurch.org, clicking that donate button or texting contribution to 73256. On our website as well, we have a number of um, resources that we've made available to you. Uh, Netflix of Bible study called um, right Now Media, as well as instructions of how to download the Version Bible app that comes in very handy with some things that we send you usually on Monday or Tuesday as a follow-up to what we've discussed on Sunday. So if you are interested in receiving some text alerts that will direct you to some of those um, extra materials that you can feed yourself during the week, I encourage you to text this, My Faith Church, to this number, um, 888-403-4294. Well, let's jump into what I believe God has for us today. Uh, before we launch into a brand new teaching series on the Sermon on the Mount that we very appropriately titled The Greatest Sermon Ever, we'll be doing that on the 18th of September. This next couple of weeks, we're going to have a couple standalone messages and we're going to look at a couple of parables. Uh, and before we jump into the parable of the workers in the vineyard, which is very appropriate because it is Labor Day weekend, right? And God's economy of grace is very different than our human economy of you do this, you get that, right? But before we do that, I want to talk to us a little bit about what a parable is. Now, a parable, I'm sure you've probably heard that before, is a teaching tool that Jesus would often use to explain something that is difficult for us to understand. A parable is a parallel. Something that Jesus uses, something that's common, something that people would have understood. Uh, many of the parables that Jesus uses um, had, had to do with soil or building a house on a, on a solid foundation or, or a treasure that was discovered in the field. These, these are things that people would understand and comprehend. And so he takes this and he uses it and places it up against a difficult spiritual concept, not to confuse us. Parables are not meant to confuse us, but they're meant to clarify. And when you look at the amount of parables in the Gospels, and only the Gospel of John does not contain any parables. And so you have the Gospel of Matthew and Mark and Luke. And when you look at these three Gospels together, these Gospel accounts, there are 40 parables that we have. A third of all of Jesus' teachings are in parable form. And a lot of the Gospels would duplicate or they, they, they're, they're telling the same parable. And so if we would add them all together, there are 61 parables that we have in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So there is obviously something that Jesus saw of benefit in terms of using parables to explain difficult concepts. Another one of the reasons why we have parables in the scripture, and by the way, it's not just in the gospels that the scripture uses parables as well. They're, they're in the Old Testament as well, but Jesus was definitely, definitely the master. But one of the reasons why Jesus used parables is because it also revealed hearts. In fact, after a very famous parable, that Jesus is telling the crowd, and he uses four different types of soils, and he uses the illustration of a farmer sowing seed, and it lands on these different types of soil. There's the, the hard soil, and that plant never takes root, and there's the good soil, and that takes root, and it produces fruit, the plant produces fruit, and then there's the rocky soil and the thorny soil. After Jesus tells this soil, he doesn't explain this, and he often would do that. He would not explain his parables because parables are meant to be discovered and they're meant to be discussed. So on this particular occasion, eventually Jesus would explain this parable to his disciples. But before he did so, his disciples go to him, and this is in Matthew chapter 13, and they ask him a question and they say, why do you speak to the people in parables? Well, why don't you just tell them what you mean and, and why don't you just tell them what you mean and mean what you say and why not just give them the hard data why do you in a sense you can kind of understand what they were saying why do you kind of beat around the bush a little bit and use parables to teach people well jesus actually gives them an answer and i want to read that for you here 
in Matthew chapter 13. He says to his disciples, he says, the disciples came to him, and this is starting in verse 10. Uh, Why do you speak to the people in parables? And he replied, because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom has been given to you, but not to them. And basically what Jesus is saying here is not everybody will get this. Not everybody's going to understand what I'm doing here. Whoever has will be given more and they will be given in abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. This is why I speak to them in parables. And then he quotes Isaiah. He says, Though seeing they do not see, though hearing they do not hear or understand, in them it is fulfilled what is said through the prophet Isaiah. You'll be ever hearing, but never perceiving. For the people's hearts have become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might, they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts. And then they would turn and I would heal them. But blessed are you with your eyes, because they see and they hear with your ears. For I tell you, many prophets and righteous people have longed to see what you see, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. Now, what does this all mean? This is what Jesus is saying. The condition of your heart, whether you have an open heart to God, whether you have an open mind to God, parables will speak to that. If you have a closed heart, you're going to have you're going to reject what the meaning of the parable is. You may get what Jesus is saying, but you're not really going to listen. You're you're going to have eyes to see, but you're going to see what you want to see and you're going to hear what you want to hear. Parables expose people's hearts. And remember, this is right after Jesus has just told a parable about the conditions of people's hearts, the four different types of soil. Now, there's a great illustration of this in the Old Testament where a parable is used to reveal the state or the status of a person's heart. If you're familiar with the prophet Nathan, Nathan goes to David, King David at the time, who is, in a, who is completely blind to his sin. He has taken another man's wife, had adultery uh, with her, Bathsheba. Eventually, she became pregnant, he tries to cover it up, and eventually her husband was murdered, and David definitely had a hand in that. And so Nathan understands, he's directed by the Lord that just just the facts David's going to reject because of the condition of his heart. And so he tells him a parable about a person who had one sheep and then another person who had a thousand sheep. And the one who had a thousand kills the one who has the one and takes that one sheep for his own. And when David hears that parable, he gets all self-righteous and angry and says, who is this person? Let's bring them to justice. And Nathan says, that's a parable. And the parable is about you. And then it was received. The the point was gotten across and it actually led to David's repentance. So parables are used by Jesus to reveal the conditions of people's hearts. And that is why a third of all of Jesus' teaching in the Gospels are in parable form. That's a lot. 33.33 whatever percent. of Jesus' teachings that we have. And remember, the Gospel of John does not contain any of the parables. So if you just look at the the content of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the amount of time that Jesus uses using parables to teach is just astronomical, right? So with no further ado, what I want to do, I'm just gonna read the parable in Matthew chapter 20, the workers in the vineyard, and understand what you're reading here. Understand what what I'm telling you. This is not Jesus saying, this is how an employer should treat his employees. If you're you're missing that point, or if you're stuck on that, you're, you're gonna miss the point of this parable. Jesus is using this parable to talk about a different economy in his kingdom, the economy of grace. And he's using what we know. We can understand employer and employee relationships, right? We can understand labor and laboring in a field and receiving a wage. And Jesus uses that to illustrate the concept of grace that is often very difficult for us to understand. So I'm going to read here, starting in verse 1 of Matthew chapter 20, this fairly familiar parable about workers in a vineyard. For the kingdom of heaven... This is how often Jesus would describe or start one of his parables. 
for the kingdom of heaven. This is God's grace economy when it comes to workers in his field, right? For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. This would often be the case. People would mull around like the town square waiting for someone to hire them for the day. And he agreed to pay them a denarius, which is a fair day's wage, for the day and sent them into his vineyard. So that's early in the day. About nine in the morning, he went out again and he saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go and work in my vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. And so they went. He went out again about noon, and then again about three in the afternoon, and he did the same thing. And about five in the afternoon, he goes back. And he goes out and he finds still others standing around. And he asks them, why have you been standing here all day doing nothing? And I love their response. They say, because no one has hired us. Well, <laughs> not necessarily true. If they would have been there, if they would have received the call, they could have been hired. So they're obviously very lazy. Because no one has hired us, they answered. And he says to them, you also go work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired, those who only worked an hour, and then going on to the first. And so the workers who were hired about five in the afternoon, they come and they each receive a denarius. And so those who came who were hired first, they expected to receive more, but each one of them also received a denarius. And when they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These who were hired last worked only an hour, they said. And you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work in the heat of the day. But he answered them. The owner of the vineyard said to them, I'm not being unfair to you, my friend. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? So take your pay and go. I want to give the one who was hired last the same as you as I gave you. What is it to you? Don't I have the right to do with what I want to do with my own money? Or are you envious because I'm generous? And really, that's the point of this parable. Are you envious because I'm generous? And understand who Jesus was teaching here, who, the, who his audience was. It was a group of religious leaders who believed that they were righteous because of their labor, because of their work. And then Jesus ends here in verse 16 with a very famous line. He says, so the, so the last will be first, and the first will be last. Now, if there's a kind of a key thought, you know, of this whole passage of scripture is this. In God's kingdom, there's just a different kind of economy. Jesus was not commenting upon employer-employee relationships in the human earthly form. He is commenting upon the currency in his kingdom, God's kingdom, the currency of grace. And so here's a few things, a few principles of, of God's economy. We can call it grace economy 101, I guess, if you want to call it, right? So here's the first principle that we see from this, from this scripture. Here's number one. There is no qualification. We read here in the scripture, for the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner. He goes out early in the morning. He hires workers for his vineyard. Eventually he comes back. He goes back at nine in the morning. He goes back at noon. He goes back at three and he goes back at five. There are five different times where the owner of the vineyard comes back and hires different workers. And in that one of those occasions, does he ever say to the workers, let's see your work history. Or um, what kind of a reputation you know, do you have? Or, or what are your qualifications he doesn't check whether they have if they have all their digits. I mean, he doesn't he doesn't question you know their their work history. He doesn't question their their resume. It seems to be that the only qualification to work in the owner of the vineyard's field is this: they accept the call. The invitation is offered, and it is offered to all. I mean, he goes back five times. Five times. This was not necessarily always done. Usually, uh, a person who owned a field, they would go at the beginning of the day. They would get all that they would need for the day. Very rarely did they have to go back. If they did, they certainly didn't go back five times. And they certainly didn't go back to the bottom of the barrel ones who were just standing around and just being hired for, for, for an hour. Jesus is making a point here. Grace has no qualification. Grace, the definition of grace, is undeserved favor. The, the idea that there is something that you need to qualify to deserve grace is really, it's an oxymoron. 
It, it is something that you can't even equate deserve with grace. And I love the way, I love the way that the, the last that are hired last, who only work an hour, I love the way they, they answer the call. This is what they say. About five in the afternoon, the owner of the vineyard goes out and sees others standing around. He says, why have you been standing here all day? And I like what they say. They're basically, they're, they're lying. Because no one has hired us. And that wasn't true. The owner had come four different occasions. If they were there all day, they had listened to the call. This invitation to come and, and, and work in this field. And this is what the owner of the vineyard says to them. He goes, you also go and work in my vineyard. Now, all scholars understand what this, what this is about. That this is about people who have come to a uh, relationship with, with Jesus at different stages of their life. You know, I've, I've done a number of, of, of funerals over the years. In fact, the reason why I have a tie on here today is I, I have one in the afternoon. So I just decided, hey, I'll be on camera with the tie, right? I've got a funeral. Uh, and in a number of the funerals that, I, that I've had, there have been a, a couple of occasions where people have had what we call kind of deathbed confessions. You know, people who have lived really their entire life without Jesus, without really a spiritual interest, they've, they've kind of lived however they wanted to live their entire life, and they're diagnosed with something, and they know it's the last hour. They, they know they don't have a whole lot of time, and it's out of fear. It's out of fear of eternity. It's out of fear of, of, of judgment that they come to place their faith in Jesus for that last hour of their lives. On one of those particular funerals I, that I was doing for, for, her, for this lady, her son-in-law comes, who was a believer uh, for a number of years, and obviously he's with his wife, the daughter of this lady who had passed. And, and he was a believer for a number of years, as well as his, his wife. Uh, and there's been several occasions where he would approach his mother-in-law and just try to talk to her about her, her spiritual destiny, about who Jesus was. And he was constantly just rejected. And so he comes up to me after the funeral, and I had shared the story about how she came to faith really at the last hour. And I may have even said this parable, if, I, if I'm remembering correctly. But he comes to me and he says, and this is, the part of the, this is the part that I do remember, he says to me, it just doesn't seem fair. It just doesn't seem fair that she could live her entire life however she wanted to live, no regard to duty, no regard to, to uh, morality. And she was not a good woman. She really was not. She was kind of a scoundrel. She was bitter. She was envious. She was very materialistic. And so he had conflicts with her. And he said to me, it just doesn't seem fair that she would be able to come to Jesus. And he's lived his entire life pretty much in this relationship with Christ. And his his wife, the, the daughter of this lady who had passed, was with him. And she says, there's two ways to look at that. Two ways to look at that. It isn't fair that we get to live. And she was referring to herself and her husband. It isn't fair that we get to live almost our entire lives with our soulmate, <laughs> with, with, the, with the one who gives us peace and, and purpose in life. And my mother didn't experience that until the very end of her life. This is really what Jesus is saying here. The lucky ones are not those who only worked an hour. The lucky ones are the ones who have labored in the fields all day with the master, having purpose in their life. You know, in our other earthly relationships, we get this, right? You know, this past August on... The 6th of August, my wife and I, we celebrated our 28th anniversary, 1994, August 6th. Now, what if I would say to you, you know what, I, I'm so glad that I met my soulmate, but I wish I wouldn't have met Tammy until I was 83. And I only, I, I, I just really wish that I was only married just for a couple years and then I just passed from this earth. You would say, there is something wrong with you, Matt. You want to spend as much time as you possibly can with your soulmate. Thank the Lord that you met her when when uh, you were 20 and, and, and she wasn't thinking right because you got the better end of that deal, right? I mean, we wouldn't, in any other relationship, we would go, of course you want to spend as much time with that person. 
the, the, your soulmate. You don't want to be married just for a couple years at the end of your life and spend the majority of your life alone. That doesn't make any sense. So why do we think it often that our relationship with Jesus is more of a burden than a blessing? Well, Jesus was commenting on that. He's revealing hearts when he uses this parable. Here's their second principle that we see in Grace Economy 101 is that grace has no classification. Not only there's no qualification other than you just answer the call, but there's no classification. There is no idea that those who were hired at noon worked twice as hard as, as those who, who worked all day. So it, it just all kind of worked out. Or those who were hired at the last hour, they just put in an incredible effort or they were indispensable or they provided a certain set of skills that those who were hired at the beginning of the day that were not. And so, you know, they were paid more because they brought a higher quality of skills. We don't read actually any of that. In fact, at the end, each of the workers were paid just simply the same. Now, in the human economy, there is this mutual need. We have the need of the employer. He needs his, his employees. He's got a product. He's got a, he's got a field to harvest. And he needs the employees. He needs the workers in the field. And we also see that those who are working in the fields, they need a job. You know, they need a, they need a payment. We don't see this here in this parable. It's almost like we see the owner of the field just coming, come just, just be a part of this. Just be a part, whether you work an hour, whether you work all day, just come and, and be a part of working in the field, working with me, the owner of the vineyard. See what Jesus was doing here, he was, he was almost saying, you know what, the, the, the workers weren't needed because the owner of the field didn't have that kind of a need. He just desired a relationship. You know, when Cameron was younger, I would get out my mower and I would fill it with gas and I would start mowing the yard. He'd come out, he had a bubble mower, he'd fill it with bubbles and he'd follow me, right? Uh, oftentimes he would just kind of stop, he'd get tired and he'd just lay down on the grass and I'd turn around and he's in, in my mowing path and I'd just pick him up and I'd you know move him out of the way. I didn't consider that an inconvenience. He'd be in the garage, you know, because he knew dad worked in the garage and I'd come in after mowing the yard. My tools were everywhere and he's sitting there in the garage. There was one actual time that uh, um, he took sandpaper that he found and, and he was going to polish my truck. And that was a that was a fun day. Right. And, and in many ways, he was he was uh, it took longer for me to mow the yard or it took longer to do things when he was out there with me because, you know, he just kind of was in the way. And I'm not saying that we're in the way, but now I want Cameron to come out. And it's not because, you know, he's 14 or 15 or 16 years old. He can definitely help me get done faster, but I could still do those things by myself. I'm not completely incapable yet. Maybe someday I will. But the reason why I want him to come out there is the same reason when he was four. <laughs> I just want to be with him. I want him to be doing the work, you know, with, with his dad. He's not necessarily needed. He's just desired. And when it comes to the work of the kingdom, you've heard me pray this prayer if you're part of Faith Church. Lord, help us to understand that we are dependent upon you. There's nothing that we can do for your kingdom in and of ourselves. We don't have the ability. We're not smart enough. We're not good enough. We don't have enough resources. We don't have the perfect strategy. Lord, you are the one that gives the increase. You are the one who can touch a human heart. You really don't need us, but you allow us to participate with you because you just want us there. And this is what I believe Jesus is saying through this parable. He's saying when it comes to the worker in the vineyard, when it, when it comes to working in God's kingdom, God is not dependent on anything or anyone. He doesn't need us. He can touch a human heart. He's had that capability since the beginning of time because he invented time. And so he doesn't really need us, but he chooses to use us because he desires to be in relationship with us. He gives us purpose. He gives us ownership. But we are dependent upon him and not the other way around. And here's the third principle that we see in the grace economy. The principle is, is this. There is no qualification. There's no classification. But there's really no compensation either. And when you look at this parable, 
Jesus says that the owner of the vineyard lined up all of his workers and he paid those who worked the least first. And he did that on purpose so that all could see that those who worked all the day would see what those who only worked for an hour received. He could have done that in reverse and they would have received their wage and they would have left and they would have no idea who's those who only worked for an hour, what they received. You see, Jesus is saying something about comparisons here and he's not saying they're positive. If we play the comparison game, my life versus your life, two things will happen. will happen. Either we'll have a heightened sense of ourself or we'll have a lowered sense of ourself and it's based on the wrong comparison. You see, if you wanna compare yourself with somebody else's life, depending on who that person is, you can come out pretty well. But in God's economy, in his kingdom, we do not receive a wage. We receive a gift. And thank goodness that we do. Because Romans 6.23 tells us this, for the wages of sin, this is what we've earned. This is what we deserve. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. You see, in God's economy, we don't receive a wage. If we think that we deserve a wage, we're making comparisons with human beings and our comparison should be our holiness versus God's holiness. And I don't even need to tell you what the outcome of that's going to be. So we don't receive a wage, we receive a gift. And in order to receive that gift, we have to come with empty hands. We have to put comparisons out of our mind. We have to put our classifications out of our mind. We have to put our qualifications out of our mind. And we simply answer the call. So my question for you is this. Have you received the call? Have you received that invitation? Have, have, are you holding on to something that, you know what, I'm just not qualified or are you holding on to something that I deserve something? Or are you holding on to an unfair comparison? You see, the owner of the vineyard who needs nothing comes to the marketplace and says, all are welcome to come live a life of purpose, to come work in the fields with me. Not because I need you in particularly, but because I just want to be with you. And whether you come late or whether you come early or whether you come somewhere in the middle, all receive the same gift. And that is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So if you have not done that, I encourage you just to pray this simple prayer. And it's not the words, it's the attitude of the heart. And it just simply says, Lord Jesus, I believe that you're the son of God. I believe that you died on the cross and I believe that you rose again. And I believe that you pay the price for my sin debt. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And I ask for your forgiveness and I'm gonna receive your ownership and your leadership in my life. And if you've done that, you have answered the call to be a worker in the vineyard, to be in relationship with the master. Oh, the Lord bless you and the Lord keep you. May his face shine upon you and give you strength until we meet again.